Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, I am delighted to talk again to Adnan Rashid. You are most welcome, sir. Thank you so much for having me again, Paul. Thank you. My pleasure. Adnan, as I'm sure you know, is a lecturer, historian, traveller, and, like me, a bibliophile. There's an impressive array of books behind you. <laughs> um, you can follow him on Twitter. Uh, the handle is Mr. Adnan Rashid. And you can see his regularly updated content on his YouTube channel. Adnan has kindly agreed to discuss the perhaps surprising question, did Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, exist? There are, in fact, a couple of Western scholars who answer in the negative. And today we will look at the historical evidence. The question of Muhammad's existence has been recently given a fresh lease of life by the publication of a book entitled Did Muhammad Exist? An Inquiry into Islam's Obscure Origins by Robert Spencer in a new and expanded edition published last year. Uh, uh, Robert Spencer, though, is not, not an academic, uh, unlike Adnan. Um, so, uh, Adnan, could you perhaps give us an introduction to the more academic issues surrounding uh, the historicity of the Prophet of Islam, upon whom be peace? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you for having me again, Paul, to address this very uh, interesting question. I say interesting because it's, uh, it's an absurd question to ask. Uh, academically speaking, most historians, when I say most, the overwhelming majority of historians, and that means 99.9% .9 of historians dealing with early Islamic history are unanimous that uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, did exist. There is no doubt about his existence. Minus or accepting maybe few, uh, a couple of people you already mentioned uh, without mentioning their names. For example, one of them is Yehuda D. Neville and Judith Corin. Both of these historians, they come from Israel and they may have their Zionist bias against Islam. And Colin Wells, who also happens to be a historian and archaeologist of uh, uh, the ancient Rome, he basically stated that, uh, uh, com com you know, denying that Muhammad existed is tantamount to Holocaust denial. OK, so it's, it's, if someone was to deny Holocaust, the Jewish people would be very upset and denying Muhammad is no different, you know, mm -hmm. because the, the event is so overwhelmingly att attested yeah. and it is so the history the history is so well preserved that denying the existence of the holocaust is no different to denying the existence of prophet muhammad so there are very few individuals who actually question or who have the audacity to question the existence of the prophet of islam where scholars do differ however um, as to how authentic the narrative about muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is whether the details about his life found in Muslim tradition or Muslim traditional um, collections on the life of the Prophet wasallam are authentic. Okay, so th sure. this is the question where scholars agree. Depending on the school of thought they follow, scholars have, uh, you know, different views. Uh, for example, there's a minimalist school uh, and minimalist school of history, they, these people believe that everything is basically untrustworthy mm. uh, unless proven. Okay. The maximalist school, on the other hand, they believe that predominantly the Muslim history, the Muslim tradition is trustworthy. Minus few points here and there, minus few reports or minus few concerns historians may have. But the general history of Islam told in Muslim traditional uh, sources are basically is is authentic the history, history of islam or the history of the prophet of islam for that matter is generally acceptable okay so uh, these schools also called the revisionist school and the tradition the traditionist school right the revisionist school basically is the is, is minimalist in its approach they doubt every single thing about the early history of islam unless it's proven to be authentic in their eyes. Okay, they have set a number of uh, set criteria they use to judge information about the Prophet of Islam and early Islam. 
On the other hand, we have the, the traditionist school, and I'm not talking about Muslim scholars here. I'm not talking about Muslim okay. theologians or Muslim historians. I'm talking about Western scholars. They have the, these two views on the early history of Islam. Yeah. One view is the revision school, and pioneers of uh, this particular school were people like Patricia Crone, Michael Cook, who later on changed his position to become more traditionist, or he was inclined towards, towards traditionalism. Uh, Crone died on her view. She remained uh, a diehard revisionist, and she was an exception, or she was basically part of the minority. On the other hand, we have the traditionist school where scholars, uh, people like Hugh Kennedy, who was a historian of early Islam. Oh, yeah. uh, there are people like Robert Hoyland. There are people uh, um, like, uh, for example, I don't know if Robert, Ho Robert Hoyland is, strictly speaking, a traditionist, but he is kind of in the middle, middle somewhere. You know, he's like, a, he's like in the middle of the, the <laughs> in the middle of the pitch. He, mm. He's neither on this side, that side, but he, he's inclined to agree with much of what the traditionists say. So there is this divide among scholars, and scholars may disagree uh, on, you know, given points. Not all of them agree on every single thing. So they have different theories, di different methodologies, different criteria to judge or to assess the information on the life of the Prophet Wasallam. So this is Western uh, historiographical tradition on early Islam, okay, to right. summarize it. So, so those people who actually completely deny the existence of the Prophet of Islam, they are very brave. They have an audacity to do so. And uh, if not all of them, most of them come from Israel. And they, some people claim have an agenda, political agenda to do this because uh, a lot of uh, these uh, skeptical works on early history of Islam are coming from Israeli scholars. And they are very, uh, for some reason, very uh, driven to question everything about Islam and the history of Islam. Sure. Okay. Yeah, so, and, and not only about the early history of Islam, this, this is even about the notion of the golden age of the House of Israel under the domain of Islam. Okay, this is another question which many Israeli scholars outrightly deny. Okay, they completely deny the, the fact that there was ever a golden age of the House of Israel under the domain of Islam. And their agenda is, of course, to paint uh, the Muslim period as oppressive, as tyrannical, as, uh, you know, uh, a very, uh, you know, this, this period was very disturbing for the Jewish people. And their agenda is to, to highlight the fact that the state of Israel is necessary to protect the Jewish people because the Jewish people have always suffered in history. So when uh, scholars come up with facts that the Jewish people actually flourished uh, during the Islamic period, in particular Islamic Spain, when Jews lived with the Muslims under the domain of Islam uh, for nearly 300 years, the Jews, uh, the Jewish people experienced uh, a sort of golden age from the year 950 to 1250. And by the way, many Jewish scholars actually uh, are proponents of that theory. Many Sephardic Jewish scholars are proponents of that theory. For, for example, people like Zion Zohar. Zion Zohar is an American Jewish historian who has written a history titled A History of Sephardic and Mitzrahi Jewry. Uh, he states in that book that the Jews experienced uh, a, a sort of golden age uh, within these 300 years from 950 to 1250. This was the golden age of the House of Israel in uh, in Islamic Spain. You're, you're saying then, that the ge geopolitical factors today do have a direct uh, influence or impact on the way some historians ply their trade. So they're not always as uh, perhaps objective or uh, as uh, perhaps they, they should be because of these because of the, the, the political situation in the Middle East. Um, and that's always been the case, I suspect, with historians. They've always been uh, affected exactly. by, by their social and political context. They don't live separate from the human race. They're, they're very much influenced by, as the rest of us are. Um, Absolutely. Uh, and th that has been the case uh, always. Mm -hmm. uh, historians, when they wrote, they wrote due to the, the needs of the time, due to the audiences they were dealing with, they were very much driven to write what they wrote to please their audiences or possibly even to play into the biases and prejudices of the time. And uh, Muslim historians are no exception. 
Muslim yeah. historians, I'm, I'm trying to be fair, I'm, as a student of history, I have to be fair, right? Uh, Muslim historians were no exception. They also did this, right? Mm -hmm. So historians can always be um, inclined to follow the geopolitical conditions and circumstances of their times. And history of Islam is no different. And this attitude goes back centuries when it comes to Western view on Islam and the prophet of Islam, right? Uh, historians have written books on this phenomenon, how uh, Islam was perceived or how Islam was seen by Western authors uh, dating back to the, the 8th century, let's say, you know, when Bede the Venerable was writing in Britain in 730s, right? 730s CE, right? Moving forward during the Middle Ages, when there was a conflict going on between the Muslim world and uh, some European powers, uh, i.e., namely the Crusades, when the Crusades were happening, many Catholic monks, due to the need uh, to treat Islam as a phenomenon, they started to write works on the Prophet of Islam. They started to accuse the Prophet of erroneous things. They wrote outright lies about the Prophet. They made up things. They made up theories. And, and you know, for example, Falk of Chats, who was one of the chroniclers of the Crusades, the first crusade in particular, he wrote that the Saracens, i.e. the Arabs or the Muslims, worship an idol of Muhammad yes. in Jerusalem. Yes. Which, 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 was an, which was an absurd lie, right? This is not true. This is, this is the worst thing you can say about Muslims worshipping an idol, right? It was, of course, not true. So these things were disseminated throughout uh, Europe for the audiences to have some kind of hostile view on Islam and Muslims uh, to, to be able to justify the Crusades as a campaign, right? And m this didn't change in the early morning period when the Ottomans became a huge threat uh, when in 1529 uh, uh, Suleiman, Sultan Suleiman had besieged Vienna and uh, the, uh, the, the Europeans became very concerned about uh, the Ottomans and started to write about Islam, the Prophet of Islam. And few books I would like to recommend in this regard are, uh, one of them is very important, uh, Islam and the West making of an image. Islam and the West making of an image. The author is Daniel Norman. Okay, Daniel Norman, an absolutely amazing book on this very topic. Then J.V. Tolland. J.V. Tolland is okay. another scholar who has written a book titled The Saracens. Okay, how the Muslims were perceived uh, throughout the Middle Ages as far as the Western uh, scholarship or Western uh, authors were concerned, right? Likewise, Prophet Muhammad, he was treated directly by some of the historians or some of the, some of the authors in uh, Europe in particular. For example, one of the books that was published in 1697, it was authored by uh, a man called Prido. Prido uh, seems to be a French name, but the book was published in the English language as well in London. In 1697, uh, it was titled The Nature of Imposture. The Nature of Imposture. Okay. In this book, Prido addresses the history of Prophet of Islam. And uh, I have used, by the way, this book in, in a lecture on the age of Aisha, where Prido doesn't attack the Prophet for that particular <laughs> marriage. Because nowadays, Prophet وسلم, is a target of hate due to his marriage with Aisha, because she well, was very young at the time. Well, apparently no, no one did in the West until the 20th century. I think Professor Jonathan Brown said the first documented case of anyone, any historian, anyone in the West criticizing the prophet of his marriage was the beginning of the 20th century, um, you know, well over a thousand years after. Um, so it's clearly a, a local, regional, Western, secular, liberal issue rather than a, a universal one that anyone would have seen as a problem. Well, in Britain, as late as the 19th century, the age of consent was very low, even if you were to pick up the, the commentaries of William Blackstone on the English law. William Blackstone was a judge in the 18th century. He had written extensive commentaries on the English law, and these commentaries were still being published uh, as late as the uh, late 19th century. And in one of the volumes that was published in 1867, and it was updated to the time, uh, uh, or uh, basically adapted to the current state of the law in 1867. In that very book, 
on page 110, it is stated the age of consent or the marriageable age for a girl is seven. And she can be uh, basically uh, at nine, she can, uh, uh, she, can, uh, she can accept dower. And at 12, she can either keep the marriage or dissolve it, right? So the, the, the marriageable age for a girl in Britain as late as 1870s was uh, seven. I mean, the earliest age, the, the minimum age was seven. So this is why no one criticized the Prophet of Islam for getting married to Aisha that yeah. young. So that's why many hostile works written in Europe uh, in those uh, times, no one criticized the Prophet for that particular bond, right? So Pedro didn't do it. Then we had Simon Ockley, who had, uh, who had written a history of the Saracens, published in 1708. Uh, he talked about the Prophet. So all of these works... Even as late, I mean, Gibbon, Edward Gibbon was an exception. He because he didn't have any Christian bias, right? He was not a Christian. Right. He did. He 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 abandoned belief in Christianity. Whether he was an atheist or not is another question. Uh, but he was not a Christian, and he uh, treated the history of the Prophet. Of so Edward Gibbon uh, was not a Christian. We don't know whether he was an atheist or an agnostic, but he was not a Christian. And for that reason, he didn't have any particular Christian bias against Islam or the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So for that reason, he kind of treated the history of the Prophet with relative uh, objecti objectivity in comparison to what was happening before Gibbon. But when we come to the colonial period in the 19th century, scholars started to paint the Prophet with negative brush once again, because colonialism required uh, for it to be seen in positive light. You see, colonial scholars and historians were painting colonial period with a lot of positivity. And in order to do that, they were painting the history of Islam or the Muslim past as a, a very negative experience. And Prophet Muhammad Wasallam was part of that. So that's why you had many colonial historians who were writing on the Prophet and uh, their treatment was also very hostile. So previously it was Christian bias, then during the colonial period, it became a colonial, political, geopolitical bias. And then in the 20th century, of course, after the creation of the State of Israel, things changed uh, uh, for another reason. Yeah. And then some, some scholars um, started to see uh, the positive in that, uh, the prophet in that light, uh, light. But now recently, a lot of things have changed. Orientalism now has become uh, an embarrassment since... Uh, the, the publishing of uh, the famous ah. book titled Orientalism by the late Edwards. Edward Said. Yeah. Uh, and since then, uh, this approach on Islam or the history of Islam or even the prophet of Islam uh, is kind of looked down upon by historians and orientalist is not a title uh, scholars like to use for themselves uh, because it's, 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 it has become an emb embarrassment, this approach. So many scholars are now breaking away from this extreme revisionist lens on Islam or this minimalist lens on Islam, they are moving away towards more traditional, uh, traditionist approach. People like Harold Motsky, for example, who mm. has recently traced back much of the prophetic tradition into the first century of Islam, while historians in the 19th century like Ignaz Golzair, who was an Orientalist, uh, uh, an Austro-Hungarian scholar who spent uh, a lot of time in Egypt studying Islam, he had this view of this. He, pro he, he was a proponent of this view that that Hadith literature, much of the information we have on the life of the Prophet, uh, is basically uh, all made up. It's, it was later on projected backwards towards the Prophet. So, so information was forged in the second and the third century of Islam. And it was projected backwards towards the Prophet Wasallam. So it was attributed to the Prophet and the chains were forged. The chains of Hadith, for example. I mean, I don't know if many uh, listeners know what chains of Hadith are. I'll give you a very quick example. So when Bukhari in the third century of Islam states that the Prophet of Islam said such and such or did... Um, uh, you know, such and such thing, uh, then he doesn't claim that on his own authority. Rather, he attributes this information to previous generations, for example. 
Bukhari had a teacher called Makki ibn Abi Ibrahim. And Makki ibn Ibrahim uh, had a teacher called Yazid ibn Abi Ubaid. And Yazid ibn Abi Ubaid had a teacher called Salma ibn al Aqwa, who was a companion of Prophet Muhammad. So, by that virtue, between Bukhari and Prophet Muhammad, we have three individuals transmitting information to each other. So, yeah. Salma ibn al Aqwa was a companion of the Prophet وسلم, who taught his student Yazid ibn Abi Ubaid. And Yazid taught his student uh, Makki ibn Abi Ibrahim, and Makki was a teacher of Imam Bukhari. So Imam Bukhari, when he says, "Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam," in other words, the Prophet of Islam, Prophet Muhammad, said, and when he when he makes the statement, he always qualifies it with the term "haddathani," or "taught me," or uh, "brought to me," or "this information was imparted to me yeah. by Mr. Makki." who was taught by his teacher, Yazid ibn Ubi Ubaid, and who was taught by his teacher, Salma ibn al-Aqwa. And Salma was basically an eyewitness. He was narrating what he saw or what he heard from the Prophet. So uh, people like Ignaz Golzai in the 19th century claimed that this chain was all made up. Mm. Okay, And the information attributed to the Prophet through these chains is basically... Uh, it came about in the second and third century, and this information was projected backwards towards the Prophet um, by using these uh, forged chains. Now, these views, thankfully, have been challenged thoroughly in this day and age. Ignaz Golzair was writing in the 19th century, and then some other scholars like Lemens, and later on in the 20th century, in the mid-20th century, Joseph Schacht, who was a German scholar, also picked up uh, from much of the information he had or mu much of the inspiration he had to write his work, the origins of the Mohammedan jurisprudence came from Ignaz, Go Ignaz Goldzeyer, right? Then Shacht was challenged by scholars like Muhammad Mustafa al-Adami in his uh, book on Shacht's origins of Mohammedan jurisprudence, a very powerful refutation. Yeah. Uh, he used it as his dissertation for, uh, you know, PhD with Cambridge University. And um, this was a very powerful refutation of Shah's position on uh, the science of Hadith or the Hadith tradition in general. So late, I mean, lately, uh, after Muhammad Mustafa Al-Azmi um, did his work or authored his work, uh, people like Harold Motsky uh, have challenged a lot of these notions, a lot of these ideas pioneered by people like Ignaz Golzai and Joseph Shah, and they have shown how their theories are defective, okay? When we look at the evidence, for example, he used one particular work uh, called Musannaf of uh, Abdul Razak, a sanani This is a collection of hadiths which consists of 30,000 reports from the Prophet and his companions. Basically, mm. it's the prophetic tradition. And Harold Motsky shows, basically arguing very powerfully that much of this tradition, a lot of this information, in fact, majority of it, it comes from the first century of Islam. And if it, if, if it comes from the first century of Islam, then uh, taking it back to the Prophet, peace be upon him, is not a big deal. It's not a big problem because Prophet himself died nearly in the mid-century, mid-7th mid, mid, mid century, right? So if this information can be traced back to the 7th century CE, then it is very highly likely to have come from the Prophet and his companions, right? So modern scholars of Hadith and Islamic tradition are challenging some, some of these uh, earlier theories on the life of the Prophet. It is in this light, some of these recent propagandists, Islamophobes, uh, outright liars like Robert Spencer, who is an open Islamophobe, he doesn't even um, you know, hide that, he's unashamedly an Islam Islamophobe, uh, it's interesting, but just on that point, uh, uh, the, the uh, I looked him up actually uh, prior to our talking now uh, on Wikipedia, and uh, he was actually banned from the United Kingdom by the Home Secretary uh, because of his extreme inflammatory views 
uh, because he, he was he was seen as not conducive to good community relations. So uh, the British government actually banned him from entering into the UK because of his extremism and his tendency to uh, rile up extremist views. He actually intended to come to speak at an EDL rally. EDL, the English Defence League is this extremist um, group, uh, pretty now defunct, I think, by Tommy Robinson, but he actually came to speak to them, gave a public speak. And the government said, no, nope, we're not having these troublemakers in the country. So um, it, it, it's taken that seriously, even by the British government. I am very thankful to the British government for taking that step because uh, this shows that this person cannot be taken seriously. He's an extremist, no doubt. Uh, what really saddens me and what really concerns me is the fact that he had been lecturing uh, in important positions uh, yeah. in the U.S., he was he was FBI, military, you name it. He was he was a regular teacher. His books were on their reading lists at the FBI and the military academies in the United States. Can you believe it? Well, I can believe it, but nevertheless, he was. It's quite extraordinary. Yes, and and not only that, Paul, and not many people know this about this individual, that he was actually quoted by Brevik, Andres Brevik, the man who massacred uh, nearly a hundred people in Norway not very long ago. So this was one of the greatest catastrophes in the history of Europe after the Second World War itself. You know, this was one of the biggest uh, mass killings that took place in the history of Europe. And and who was responsible for it? I mean, people like Ian Hersey Ali and Robert Spencer were directly mentioned or referenced in his manifesto, which was full of all sorts of uh, hateful uh, narrative. So imagine... Uh, if if this individual was writing books like this on another community living in Europe, right? Uh, he wouldn't be he wouldn't be given the the the, the freedom he has in the U.S. Unfortunately, uh, I'm very thankful to the British government for not allowing people like this to to come here and disturb the peace. And and he he is uh, occasionally or frequently lecturing for the Hindutva movement in India, <laughs> out of all places and all. Movements, he, Hindutva found him to be the Hindutva movement found him to be inspirational for some okay. reason. And he's appearing on the platforms. He's talking about whether Muhammad existed or not. Hindutva, as we all know, mm. is is no less than uh, uh, you know Nazism, uh, the RSS ideology which uh, dominates Indian politics today. Unfortunately, is is very similar to Nazism, right? What the Nazis were doing to the Jewish people, Hindutva are. Uh, the Hindutva movement in India is doing exactly the same. And for some reason, Robert Spencer, sitting in the U.S., has the freedom to spread hate against Muslims uh, through uh, these Hindutva uh, hate mongers. So people like him, it doesn't surprise me at all when they write books like Did Muhammad Exist? Okay, they don't have any shame. They don't have any credibility to defend. They don't have any respect in academic circles. Even academics would not quote people like Spencer in the books. You know why? Because because they they would they, they would be laughed at. They would be mocked. But, but you yeah. mentioned that you mentioned that Adna. But uh, just to say, uh, it, it came out again when I was looking into this. That not one of his books, published books, he he has published quite a few books, has ever been peer reviewed ever. So that means that his historical works, uh, I use the inverted commas there, has never been submitted for peer review, which is the standard academic procedure when you produce a work of scholarship that you let your fellow scholars review it for critical assessment. And he's never, ever done this. None of his works are being peer reviewed, which means they've not, they don't really pass as scholarship in the normal sense of the term at all. They can't, they can't be called scholarly because he refused to have them peer reviewed. I wonder why. I mean, this is a pattern, Paul. You're absolutely right. This is a pattern with most Islamophobes and bigoted historians and authors. They don't get peer reviewed. They don't get any academic credibility. They don't even get accepted by major academic institutions because these people are not scholars. They are propagandists. Mm -hmm. They are simply picking information selectively from a number of different works and they put it together and they call it a book. They call it a book. Book it is, but is it academic? Is it factual? Is it even uh, fair? These are the questions that need to be addressed. And, and on top of that, these people are actually causing real harm. Mm. They are causing real harm in the world. Like in India. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, India, Europe, 
in America, there's, there, there are a lot of hate crimes. And um, ironically, this person claims to be a Christian. I had a discussion with him a while back, uh, this person called Robert Spencer, uh, the, 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 the person you mentioned earlier. Um, I had a discussion with him online and I asked him this question that if you question the existence of uh, Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, or Muhammad of traditional Islam, because he doesn't say Prophet Muhammad didn't exist as a historic figure. What he says is that the, the Prophet Muhammad of traditional Islam didn't exist. Right. right? So right. How Islamic tradition uh, presents him. That pre presentation is actually not factual. This is no. what he claims, right? To be fair with him, right? So I asked him this question. You claim to be a Christian. How true the representation or the presentation of Jesus Christ is in your eyes? Because the, the, the figure of Jesus has been questioned by yeah. serious historians, right? Muhammad hasn't been questioned. His existence and much of the tradition about him is, of course, uh, debated, but the existence of Prophet Muhammad has never been questioned by any serious historian. Jesus and his existence has been questioned. So it, it is ironic that you write this book, Did Muhammad Exist? You should be writing a book, Did Jesus Exist? Using your own criteria, your own standard to raise, same, raise the same questions about Jesus Christ and his tradition before you do it with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yeah, it's interesting. Bart Ehrman, actually, uh, Professor Bart Ehrman has written a book recently called uh, On This Subject, on, on mythicism, the, this idea that is gaining traction in some circles, the one or two scholars that Jesus never existed. So he felt he had to write a refutation of this uh, to give the, the massive evidence that Jesus obviously did exist. I mean, that's not seriously questioned by scholars. Yeah, so so coming back to the issue again, you know, the prophet of Islam and the, and the tradition about him, uh, we the Muslims, we believe, uh, because we have a different epistemology when it comes to Western scholarship, Western scholarship or Western history writing is Eurocentric. Yeah. It is very centric. It is driven by... Uh, um, certain unpronounced yeah. ideologies, for example, uh, extreme skepticism, uh, I mean, even liberalism and secularism, I I I even empiricism is applied on history writing. Uh, any, any notions of miracles or supernatural events in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu are outrightly rejected by Western historians. Okay? Yeah. You, you Just, cannot have a prophet in Western historiography, a prophet who actually is a prophet sent by God, who does what prophets yeah. do. That is a priori ruled out from the beginning. Before you even look at the evidence, it's rejected. Uh, and exactly. This, this is historical research. Um, I mean, if that's not bias, I've never come across bias. I mean, it's the most extraordinary philosophical prejudice I've ever come across to actually rule out uh, the actual prophetic role of prophets without even considering the evidence in the name of history. Wow, you know. Are you there, Paul? I am, yeah. There's a slight, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're absolutely right, you know. I think we might have gone to a pause again, Adnan. Hang on. Okay. A second. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think it's probably yeah. my side. I'm in Bahrain here. The weather's quite windy. I don't know if that's affecting the. You, um, you might have to do some editing later on. Anyway, you might have to do definitely some. Definitely be editing uh, where appropriate. Don't worry about that. Let's Will you continue? Please do. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're okay. Okay. So you're absolutely right, Paul. Uh, what you are saying there is absolutely spot on. Uh, European writing is very much driven by certain cultural norms, mm. cultural biases, even scholarly biases call them that, right? Uh, because uh, the European view on history is very much naturalistic. Okay, it is yeah. driven by... Uh, with uh, naturalism, all of these... Historians see history. So any uh, any idea which is uh, which indicates a supernatural or which which, which refers to a supernatural event uh, is simply rejected by Europeans. So so miracles of Moses, for example, miracles of Jesus, uh, potential miracles, miracles of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay, they are outrightly rejected as forgeries, as hagiographical, uh, uh, you know. Uh, exaggerations and as spiritual 
um, how can I put it, uh, deliberations, and they, they have no place in history. So as far as hist historians are concerned, they are basically looking at an individual in his milieu, uh, whether he's in Arabia or whether he's in Judea, yeah. century, or whether he, he, whether Moses, I mean, some, some even question the existence of Moses, right? So we, the people of religion, we, uh, Muslims in particular, we have a different sort of epistemology when it mm. comes to history writing. We do accept miracles. We do accept the supernatural. We do accept those reports about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where miracles are narrated. So this is where the, the, the fundamental difference is between Muslim view on history and Western academic view on history. And both views you know, have their virtues, their strengths, and there are some weaknesses as well. Okay, so a theological history, or, uh, sorry, a theological study of the Islamic history is not necessarily the same as the secular study of Islamic history. Just like uh, previously one of, uh, one of the scholars you had on your podcast, uh, I forgot his name, the Ismaili gentleman, um, yeah, uh, yeah. He 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 presented a very good, uh, you know, breakdown or very good summary of this. Basically, so there are people who are studying uh, religions theologically, and there are people who are studying religions with a secular lens. Okay, and both of these lenses don't have to come back with the same conclusions. They don't have to, right? Because the methodologies they are pursuing are very different. Okay, so when people assume that the secular historians writing predominantly in the West have to agree with theological conclusions of theologians writing on history, they are absolutely wrong because the methodology, uh, the lens, and the approach is completely different. So this uh, distinction has to be made. That's why many Western scholars end up questioning much of the Islamic tradition because they have this very secular, liberal, Western cultural lens on the history of Islam. That's mm -hmm. why their conclusions vary from scholar to scholar, from institution to institution, from, uh, from, uh, from place to place. Mm -hmm. Okay, This is why many Western historians uh, are not even in agreement on basic things. And I'm talking about differences within Western historiographical tradition, right? I'm not talking about Muslim historians and Muslim scholars. Okay, Michael Cook, for example, doesn't necessarily agree with Robert, Robert Hoyland. Okay, Robert Hoyland doesn't necessarily agree with everything um, um, Fred M. Donner, uh, Donner has to say about the early... Con or Walter Kaige, for example, doesn't mm. necessarily agree with everything Lawrence I. Conrad has to say on the early history of Islam, and the list goes on, okay? That's why all of these scholars come up with different conclusions based upon their studies. So okay. there is no set methodology to study the history of Islam. True, but can, can I just, uh, just pause this for a second and um, quote uh, some words from um, Professor Nikolai Sinai, he's Professor of Islamic Studies at Oxford, he's a young German uh, academic, a brilliant uh, scholar. He's a professor at Oxford University. He's just written a book called uh, The Quran, A Historical Critical Introduction. And he very much subscribes to the historical critical method, which does have these limitations that you've just outlined, Adnan. Nevertheless, uh, there's a section there entitled Muhammad in the Light of Non-Islamic Sources, which I'd just like to share with you, because just to establish the incredible evidence, very early evidence that Muhammad um, certainly existed. Um, and he uh, says one of the earliest references occurs in a Greek text that called the Doctrina Jacobi. It's a Greek, um, anti sorry, a Christian anti-Jewish text written in 634 CE. Now, the prophet, of course, passed away. Traditional date is 632 CE. And this text mentions the appearance of a prophet coming with the Saracens, who is said to be announcing the advent of the Messiah and claiming to be in possession of the keys of paradise. Uh, this is quoting from the book. And then um, in the next paragraph, it says, what matters in the present context is, above all, that non-Islamic sources explicitly confirm the existence of an Arab prophet by the name of Muhammad himself. So apart from the doctrina Jacobi's mention of an anonymous 
Saracen prophet. There's a text from Syria, probably composed around 640 CE. So remember when the time, the date of the prophet's death, this is 640 CE, reporting on a battle between the Romans and, quote, the Arabs of Muhammad. So this, Muhammad's name is actually mentioned in a Syriac text, 640 CE. And that, and that text is dated, he says, with impressive precision to Friday, the 4th of February, 634. So th this wow. text composed 640 CE refers to an event, this a battle between uh, the Romans and the Arabs of Muhammad, and it's actually dated to the fifth, sorry, Friday the 4th of February, 634 CE, which is just two years after the prophet passed away. Thus, he concludes, Muhammad is attested by name already within a decade of his traditional date of death. Um, and I could go on and on. I mean, this is incredible. I mean, this was... There is a Syriac uh, fragment, okay, uh, men that mentions uh, the Arab conquest, right? Uh, and uh, this fragment is is basically uh, it mentions the Battle of uh, Javitha, which took place in 636, okay, and which is again a very close reference. And it mentions the name of the Prophet, uh, and it goes. And in January they took the world for their lives. So they took the word for their lives. Uh, the sons of Emissa. Okay, uh, and many villages were ruined with killing by the Arabs of Muhammad, and a great number of people were killed, and captives were taken from Galilee as far as Beth. So this is a, a, a source written in 636 CE. Um, okay, uh, and basically this is a this is a marginal marginal note on uh, uh, on a gospel. Okay, wow. th this was basically a manuscript of the Gospel of Matthew and Gospel of Mark. Mark. And there's a marginal note which mentions the conquest um, of certain parts of Syria uh, by the Arabs. And the name of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi is mentioned specifically. Then there is another 7th century chronicle of 640, right, which basically mentions uh, uh, the date, which is 947 AG. AG is Anno Grecorum. Anno Grecorum is basically the, the Greek year which corresponds to 635, 636 again, right? And it mentions clearly the name of the Prophet Sallallahu Okay, for example, uh, February 4th, at the ninth hour, there was a battle between the Romans and the Arabs of Muhammad in Palestine, 12 miles east of Gaza. The Romans fled, leaving behind the patrician, uh, his name is there, whom the Arabs killed. Some 4,000 poor villages of Palestine were killed there. Jews, Christians, and Samaritans. So the point here is that these early, very early references to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by name, by name, are there. So these Israeli scholars like uh, Yehuda uh, D. Nevo and Judith, um, I forgot her name, uh, subhanAllah. Uh, well, yeah, uh, Judith Corin. Judith Corin and Yehuda Di Nevo, they have an audacity to even claim that there is a question about the existence of the Prophet. So this this these kind of people have to be ignored and they have to be put in their place. And the scholars have done that. So there are plenty of references. Not only that, Paul, there is so much uh, evidence on papyri, early Islamic papyri that have been found in Egypt. OK, um, with other, of course, Greek papyri and Coptic papyri. There are bilingual papyri documents uh, that have been found in Egypt. Uh, so they have Greek and Arabic written on them. These are mostly tax documents, and they come from the very early period uh, from the conquest of Islam, right? Uh, we're talking about 630s, again, 630s. Some of these documents are as early... There are inscriptions that mentions the Prophet of Islam by name around mm. Mecca. Uh, Meccan mountains, you go around there, you will find inscriptions. They have been documented. For example, one of the inscriptions even mentions the death of Omar bin Khattab, mm. the second caliph of Islam. There is an inscription near Mecca which mentions the death of the second caliph of Islam. His name is mentioned and the date is 24 Hijri. Wow. Okay, now some, some may say, hold on a second, how is that relevant to Muhammad? It is directly relevant to Muhammad. Why? Because it confirms a number of things. That inscription, which is a piece of evidence, epigraphic 
evidence, albeit, right? Uh, what, does it, what does it make clear? It makes clear that there was a man called Omar, okay, uh, who has been mentioned in Islamic sources, and he died in the year 24. And Islamic sources tell us, the Hadith literature, that Omar bin Khattab did indeed die in late 23 or early 24. Right, confirming hadith literature now. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So the inscription confirms the veracity of the hadith literature. Right. Okay, uh, and in in minute details, by the way, these are very delicate details of chronology, of personalities, of even uh, standardized Arabic writing, for example. Wow. So many points can be deduced from one small sentence inscribed on a rock near Mecca. So this particular inscription not only confirms the veracity or the validity of the Islamic chrono chronological calendar, which is called the Hijri calendar. So by the year 24, the Hijri calendar is already. So when does this Hijri calendar uh, start? It starts in year one. And what happened in year one? The migration of Prophet Muhammad from Mecca to Medina. So this is year 24 when this inscription was uh, inscribed. And the, uh, one of the historic uh, incidents that has been narrated by Islamic history is confirmed. There are many, many more coins, for example, the numismatic evidence. Okay, uh -huh. this, is, uh, this is your speciality, of course, Adnan, uh, is, is coins. Exactly. Mm. Coins alone give us so much uh, that we see Prophet Muhammad وسلم, mentioned as Muhammad Rasulullah on early Islamic Arab Sasanian coins. I'm talking about uh, the mid uh, first century of Islam, almost 20 to 30 years after the Prophet had died, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, there are coins minted by Muslim rulers. Uh, some of them happen to be companions of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. By the way, their names are also on coins. Wow. Abdullah bin Zubair, for example, one of the companions who was a caliph in, in Mecca, his name is on coins I in the know. Persian. Mm. Yeah, his name is on coins yeah. in Persian Pahlavi text. Right. So if you pick up coins minted by uh, uh, the governors of Abdullah bin Zubair in Iraq, in particular, or in Persian territory, you will see the name of Abdullah bin Zubair clearly inscribed on these coins. So what do these coins prove? They prove the existence of these companions of Prophet Muhammad. They prove the existence of the governors because the governor, the names of the governors are also on the coins who also happen to be in some cases companions of Prophet Muhammad. Right. So. There is so much evidence uh, when it comes to epig epigraphic record near Mecca on the rocks, uh, coins, manuscripts, for example, right? Mm. Quran manuscripts, the Birmingham parchment has been dated somewhere between carbon dated, radiocarbon dated somewhere between um, 668 to, uh, sorry, 568, 568 to 645 CE. Okay, this is the entire length of the Prophet's life. We are told within the Islamic tradition that the Prophet of Islam was born somewhere around 571 CE and he died in 632 CE. So this Birmingham parchment has been carbon dated to have come from uh, between this period uh, uh, 568 okay, to 645 CE. This is an estimated date. We do understand that. And the date does not uh, suggest as to when the manuscript was penned, but what the date tells us that the animal was killed in between these two dates, these two markers, right? And this is the life of the prophet. This uh, is the and, entire. And, and his name is mentioned uh, explicitly four times. I understand in the Quran itself, There's explicit reference to the prophet in the Quran, which is now securely dated, uh, um, and there's other manuscripts as well. I understand now the consensus of Western scholarship is that the Quran we have today is the same Quran that goes back at least the time uh, of Uthman, the, uh, the caliph, but the, uh, there's no reason I think it, it can't go back to the time of the prophet because he, Uthman was a companion of the, the prophet himself. And, the, and this text mentions Muhammad four times by name, but of course he has referenced many other times with other titles as prophet or messenger and so on. So there's, exactly. there's an abundance of first century uh, evidence. I mean, I, I don't want to, uh, this is not a question of being polemical about Christianity, but if you were to ask, j just for the sake of comparison, objectively, you know, how many uh, first century texts from the Christian first century do we have of the Gospels, for example, if from the first set? How many manuscripts do we have from the first century 
uh, AD of the Gospels? And of course, the answer, unfortunately, is nothing. I mean, literally nothing at all. You have to go into the second century, and then you find a tiny little uh, fragment of credit cards size fragment, P52 it's called, in the University of Manchester. I've seen it. And that's now been dated later rather than earlier by more recent scholarship. It used to be said about 125 AD, perhaps, as a fragment of the Gospel of John. Now it's been dated by recent scholarship later, maybe 150, maybe even the end of the second century. Um, and it's only with the fourth century AD that you get complete copies of, say, the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of John, the Gospel. Um, I remember asking, I think it was Bart Ehrman, this question on, on blogging theology. What's the earliest date we have? A complete copy of the Gospels. And it's the fourth century AD. And Jesus, of course, existed in the first century AD. Now, this is not meant to be a polemical point, but just to compare the Christian and the Islamic um, evidences for the respective scriptures. And they're quite, quite strikingly different. How early and, and abundant it is for the Islamic sources and, and how l- very much later it is for the Christian sources. That's just how it no is. There is no comparison. There is no, no comparison whatsoever. Because, as you said rightly, there is nothing, virtually, virtually nothing, not even a piece of... Uh, you know, uh, cloth or even a coin or even even a fragment of a manuscript that mentions Jesus Christ by name from the first century of Christianity. There's absolutely nothing. What we do have, with some confidence, we can claim that uh, this evidence about the life of Jesus Christ, uh, albeit uh, in untrustworthy sources, it comes from the second century, right? So there is no comparison between the history of Islam and the history of Christian uh, uh, religion or uh, Christian or development of Christianity. And it would be an unfair comparison. To be fair, uh, to do a comparison between Islam and Christianity as two religions, uh, this would be an unfair, uh, you know, um, um, comparison because Muslims became very dominant within the first 50 years of their history. Globally speaking, while the Christians, they were struggling to survive for 300 years. They went through some heavy, heavy, heavy persecutions inflicted upon them by different Roman emperors, for example, starting from Nero in the the 70s. Then we come to Marcus Aurelius, his persecution. Then we have, uh, you know, the persecution of uh, uh, Decius in 250s, right, uh, from 249 to 251. Uh, For two years, this was one of the, the worst persecutions of the Christians. Then we have Diocletian who persecuted the Christians. And then uh, Constantine gave some respite to Christians to breathe and they had some breathing space. So there's no comparison between the two religions, you know, when it comes to development, the development of these religions, right? So uh, there is so much about the Prophet of Islam and Islam itself as a tradition, as a philosophy, as a phenomenon, there is so much. We can pretty much build all of Islam or our beliefs from within the first century. I'm not, and I'm not, I'm not making yeah, this statement yeah. loosely. I'm, I'm, I'm being very confident and very responsible about this statement. Anything we practice and believe in Islam, okay, anything to do with Islamic practices and beliefs can be traced back to the first century, either by epigraphic evidence manuscript evidence, numismatic evidence, or um, other forms of evidences. For example, I mean, I'll, I'll throw something out there, right? Mm-hmm. Salah, our prayer, how we pray, right? It is entirely documented in the Hadith tradition. That's why I insist that the Hadith tradition uh, and its credibility is confirmed by material evidence that comes from the first century of Islam. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I will repeat the statement. The Hadith tradition, okay, and its veracity is supported and confirmed by looking at the material evidence that comes from the first century Islam. I'm talking about within 30 to 40 to 50 years after the Prophet of Islam. We see the evidence for the Hadith tradition or whatever the Hadith tradition tells us, okay. Even the names mentioned in the chains have been found inscribed on rocks around Mecca. Wow. There are inscriptions by some of the narrators of hadith from the Sahaba and from the Tabi'een. So, so from the first generation and the second generation, people who are transmitting the prophetic tradition. So the theory Ignaz Goldzeyer and Joseph Shach pioneered crumbles. It falls apart when we consider some of the epigraphic uh, evidence from 
uh, the Arabian Peninsula. You see these p- p- pilgrim routes coming from Yemen uh, and from Medina. On these routes, because they were well-known routes to Mecca, pilgrims were coming to uh, do the Hajj and Umrah. So on the way, they would stop to rest and they would go and inscribe their names and messages on rocks. Right. Okay. Yeah. There's an account on Twitter. It's in Arabic. It's called Athar uh, Athar Nukush. Athar Nukush. Uh, you find hundreds, hundreds of the, these pictures of these inscriptions. Some of them actually inscribed by the companions of the Prophet Muhammad uh, themselves. Right. So we have inscriptions by the hands of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad. We have inscriptions by the students of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And the names are mentioned. So this theory pioneered by Ignaz Golzar and Shah falls apart when we look at those names on the rocks. So these people were real people. They were not invented names. They, they didn't just come out. Of, of a vacuum or mental vacuum, right? I, mean, I know you don't like these comparisons, but I will. I just find it interesting, just for the record, that if you look at the traditional authorship of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's commonly assumed, of course, Matthew, the disciple of Jesus, wrote the Gospel of Matthew and, and, and so on. But actually, the, these traditional uh, authorships are, are now questioned or, or rejected by virtually all scholars. So, for example, in Matthew, I, don't, I actually don't know of any major New Testament scholar that believes the disciple Matthew wrote Matthew, for example. Um, and, and again, there's not meant to be polemical, but just to the, the extreme difference here, there's not skepticism. It's just there's no evidence that Matthew wrote Matthew is a second generation text, not written by an eyewitness, etc. And contrast that with the ever increasing abundance of actual first hand companions of the prophet who, whose, whose words, whose inscriptions we now have. The, the, the contrast, you say, is very striking. And I don't make, make these points to be polemical, but just to give a sense of the differences in the Abrahamic religions, so the evidences for these religions is quite striking, I think. Absolutely, Paul. And what really surprises me and strikes me is that these Christian missionaries, some of them, who are absolute bigots, I'm not talking about scholars and intellectuals. I have a lot of respect for Christian scholars and intellectuals and decent uh, human beings, right? But there are some indecent <laughs> human beings out there. Some of these Christian missionaries we, we see very often, uh, okay, they have the audacity to even question the veracity of the Islamic tradition when they have that background you mentioned uh, yeah, quite right. This is true. I mean, most scholars are very clear uh, on the fact that these four Gospels are anonymous documents and the names are attributed to these documents in the mid-2nd century, if not later. Okay. Late, and late second, yeah. and yeah. Stanton, Graham, Graham Stanton made it very clear that these works were uh, called memoirs of the apostles. They weren't even called scripture. They were given the status of scripture in the late second or early third century. Okay, it was in the late second or early third century when the New Testament writings uh, became scripture. Uh, in the second century, scripture meant the Old Testament. Mm. So, as far as the Christians were concerned, when they used the word scripture, oh, for example, some of the early church fathers, like uh, you know, um, uh, Polycarp or Justin, and these people, when they mentioned the word scripture, they meant the Old Testament, oh, right? Yeah. Even Paul, even Paul, when he's writing in his epistles, when he uses the word scripture, he means the Old Testament, yeah. because the New Testament the, the New Testament doesn't exist. It didn't exist, exactly. <laughs> yeah. This is the irony. When, when Christians say, let's go back to the early, early Christians, let's be like them, and I, I believe that, you know, Baptists say this evangelical, okay, do that, that's fine, but you do realize you won't have a New Testament, your Bible would disappear, because the New Testament... Yeah written then it, it became a canon much much later um so the, but the, the islamic tradition is very different because as you say you mentioned salah specifically the the five daily prayers and how they're done this, this is attested uh to right from the beginning uh from the prophet himself no, i was going i was going to give an example of salah depicted oh. on a coin wow. depicted on a coin paul okay the coin was minted in iraq in the year 74 hijri i'm talking about you know, this is when the companions of the Prophet of Islam are alive. There are hundreds of companions. Of the, they, are, they are still alive. People like Anas bin Malik. Okay. Abdullah bin Zubair only died a year before this coin was minted. Abdullah bin Zubair died in 73. Right. Uh-huh. And some companions, major companions, uh, were, were still alive. And what does this coin depict? 
Now, people can go and Google the coin, right? The coin was minted by the Umayyad governor of Iraq. His name was Bishr bin Marwan. He was a brother of Abdul Malik bin Marwan, the Umayyad Caliph at Damascus, right? Bishr bin Marwan was the Umayyad governor of Iraq, and he minted a coin with the Caliph leading the Salah, leading wow. prayer on the coin. So if you Google Bishr bin Marwan, Dirham from Iraq, 74 Hijri, if you Google this, you will see plenty of images of this coin where the Imam is standing in front of two uh, followers. There are two followers behind the Imam, right? So the Imam is raising his hands like this mm. up to his ears. So in other words, this is basically signifying the fact that he's leading the prayer and yeah. two people behind him have their hands folded on their breasts like this, right? Yeah. So many, many jurisprudential uh, disputes are also resolved by this coin, right? Mm -hmm. There are, as you know, as you know, there are differences between Muslims as to how exactly uh, we pray, right? Some some claim that you okay. tie your hands. They're, they're, they're very slight differences. It's not as if, you know, yeah. it's a very, nothing right where you hold your nothing. very, very much. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. But the point I'm making is that coin resolves even those issues. Not many people are aware because I, I'm our, scholars, really speaking, have mm -hmm. our scholars have generally neglected that numismatic evidence. They're not, many, most scholars of Islam are not aware of epigraphic evidence numismatic evidence, even manuscript evidence, unfortunately, because these are very technical fields. They only came, they only gained the prominent prominence they have today in the, in the 20th century, mostly and in the 21st century. Previously, scholars didn't use these things yeah. as evidence. Now, the importance is coming to light, right? So this coin minted by Bishop bin Marwan actually depicts the Salah. So where do we get the details of the Salah? In the Hadith literature. Mm. It is in the Hadith literature we are told that the Prophet وسلم, when he started praying, he raised his hands up to his shoulders like this. So that's what we see the Imam doing on the coin, right? Mm. And uh, the Prophet's uh, garments were above his ankles. We see uh, the Caliph wearing his garments above the ankles. Really? Okay, yeah, absolutely. Oh. And and then and then we see the followers have their hands tied on the on the chests. So the right right hand is on top of the left hand. Right. So, so all these details. The right the, uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah sure. mm. Your right hand on top of your yeah. left hand. Yeah, and, yeah. and the dispute between the Muslim scholars uh, of the second and third century was where do you place the hands? Yeah. Some, some basically said on the chest, the strongest yeah. opinion, according to the, the most authentic reports or the most authentic hadith, the strongest opinion is that you place your hands on the chest. Right. But then there are those who believed. Uh, on on the on on the stomach or yeah. on the navel below the navel, right? So these differences are resolved by looking at this coin. So you Google the coin Bishr bin Marwan, seventy four Hijri dirham. You will see the coin with the caliph leading the prayer, as it is described in the Hadith literature, which we find in collections like Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawud, Tirmizi, and Ibn Majah. So all of these scholars who question the veracity of the Hadith literature or the Islamic tradition. It, it basically, you know, flies back into the faces. Look, look at this evidence. This so such powerful evidence we have from the first century. From the lives of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, the torch bearers of the prophetic tradition. Okay, so this is why many scholars today are telling these revisionists and these minimalists that to claim that the Islamic tradition is uh, predominantly untrustworthy is to claim a grand conspiracy is to claim a grand conspiracy yeah. that was undetected by all these Muslim scholars mm -hmm. uh, from the second, third, and the fourth century. They were completely blind. They were not aware. They were completely dumb. Okay. They had no idea what was going on. They couldn't detect. This is why uh, when Muhammad Mustafa al Adami uh, treated Joseph Shah's uh, theory on the Hadith literature in his book on Shah's. Uh, origins of Mohammedan jurisprudence, uh, he basically, he made this very point that we have so many multiple chains giving us the same information. For example, if you were to claim about a hadith that it is projected backwards and the chain is full, then what do you do with all these multiple chains that give us the same content? The report is exactly the same or slightly differently worded. Yeah. It comes from Spain. It comes from Egypt. It comes from Yemen, 
It comes from Iraq. It comes from Azerbaijan. We have so many different chains giving us the same content. So it is as if there was a grand conspiracy going on. A global conspiracy involving vast numbers of people across the planet, all at the same yeah. time agreeing. And, and this conspiracy has left no trace on history. No one's ever mentioned it, even though, yeah, it doesn't quite work, does it? Yes, absolutely. So, absolutely. So, so, you know, this topic is so vast that we can go on and on and on. And just if we start talking about the epigraphic evidence alone, Paul, believe you me, because I've seen some of it and it's just absolutely mind blowing. You can, I, think, wow. I think what we have to do, to, to be fair to you, because we don't want to exhaust you, uh, is may, maybe, uh, God willing, you can come back on again and talk about this uh, epigraphic evidence, because it's so, I mean, I did this, this coin you mentioned about, Salah, I, I, uh, I didn't know. I mean, why would I know? We don't know very much, but this is striking and significant uh, physical coinage and uh, really deserves to be heard about. So I'm, I'm extremely grateful that you've shared this information. And I hope um, people will do a little uh, excerpts from this video and uh, distribute it on TikTok and social media just to get the word out there because it's really actually very exciting. Um, and uh, and the risk of, well, more than the risk, the certainty of sounding like a polemicist, there is nothing comparable in Christianity that I'm aware of from the first century at all uh, for very different reasons. Uh, but there's complete absence of any coinage, obviously, with the apostles' names on or anything like that. It just, it just doesn't exist. So uh, this is very exciting that there should be such early physical evidence for uh, Islam. And it wasn't inevitable. Other major religions in the world don't have that. Uh, Islam does. Um, and, uh, and that's just wonderful news. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm looking at the coin. If I can quickly show it to you so that the, so the audience can see what I'm talking about, right? Uh, yeah. There is a picture I found. Uh, I, I, I'm trying to magnify it. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is, I just Googled Bishar bin Marwan and you can see. Oh my goodness. Okay. Okay. You can see the caliph standing yes. Yes. in front, his hands raised, and there are two people behind him praying behind him. Okay. That's amazing. So this, this is the salah depict, depicted on the coin and scholars are unanimous. Scholars, numismatic scholars, they are unanimous. Okay. This is a depiction of Islamic prayer. On the coin, the, the 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 debate between them is whether this is the caliph himself or the governor who is who is uh, leading the. What, what is the Arabic? Is, I know this is an Arabic inscription. Is that possible to decipher that? No, no the, the inscription is Pahlavi. It's in Persian, oh, Persian. ancient Persian. Okay. The inscription has the name of the governor and the date and the uh -huh. mint, right? But yeah. but the the depiction is of the caliph. Leading the prayer, raising his hand, well, and it, two it, people. It would, be, it would be the caliph, I understand anyway, the, the leader, the head of the nation, the imam who would lead the prayer anyway. That would be the normal practice, I would have thought. Exactly, exactly. That's what some some scholars argue that this has to be caliph himself yeah. because he's the imam. And the, and coins coins was used for propaganda reason as well. The reason why Abdul Malik bin Marwan would be put on the coin leading the prayer is to tell the Khawarij who were at the time launching many rebellions in Iraq because there were many rebellions in Iraq against the Umayyad state. And this coin was minted to show the Khawarij that there is only one boss of the Muslims and that's the Caliph. And he's the, pre the, the reason why, the reason why he is the, the head of the state is because he is the one leading the prayer, yes, right? Yes, yes. But this is like a propaganda yeah. tool for the Caliph or the cal uh, Caliphal establishment to show the Khawarij and the general masses in Iraq that Caliph is the Imam. And the biggest sign of Imamate in Islam is that he leads the prayer. Exactly. Basically. Well, what, what I love is that you and I are referencing a coin that was made, was it to make that point, 1,300 years ago. And we're talking about it today in the 21st century. Uh, and that's extraordinary. Uh, and, it's, it's still, and it's still relevant and significant. It's not just a historical artifact. It teaches us about how Islamic prayer is supposed to be done and who's supposed to lead it and what that means for Muslims. You know, there's it's rich, rich lessons there for us today. It's not just a bit of historical curiosity. It's very much a living fact. Absolutely. So, Paul, finally, uh, I would like to mention one particular source for anyone who wants to study the the the, the physical evidence for the physical evidence of early Islam. Uh, when when it comes to coins, the earliest Quranic manuscripts and some papyri, uh, they need to go to Islamic-awareness.org. Okay, 
Yes. Islamic hyphen awareness dot org is a website. If you go to the Quran section, if you go to the website and you will see different sections. If you go to the Quran section, then you will see a section on Quran manuscripts. And if you go to the coins section, you will see early Islamic coins and you will see the evolution of early Islamic coins to what they became later. And then you will see some papyri evidence as well. So it's a very powerful source for anyone interested in the and the physical evidence for early Islam, inshallah, yeah. is there. What they do lack, however, is uh, a detailed analysis on Islamic inscriptions from uh, Mecca and Medina, the ones I mentioned earlier. So there are th this, this phenomenon is still being studied by scholars. There are some scholars actually... Robert Hoyland, by the way, refers to this phenomenon in one of his articles. Uh, by the way, Robert Hoyland is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is one of the biggest scholars on Islamic, early Islamic period. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, he's teaching at Oxford University. He has uh, written amazing books on early Islam. Uh, and uh, check him out, Robert Hoyland, Robert G. Hoyland. And he mentions in one of his articles that there are over 50,000 inscriptions from Arabia, okay, uh, mentioning these things I highlighted earlier, and they are yet to be studied. So Hoyland is aware He's aware of this evidence and he knows that it is yet to be studied. It has been, for some reason, for some reason, it has been ignored and sidelined. And I believe, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I believe uh, if this evidence comes to light, the revisionist school will crumble. Okay. Uh, the, this minimalist view on Islam will completely disappear. It will have no credibility and all these people will be completely, uh, you know, um, become a laughing stock. You know, these revisionist and minimalist scholars, uh, because a lot of these inscriptions, if not all, directly support the Islamic tradition and its veracity. Mm. I was just going to mention uh, your role in this uh, Adnan is actually uh, very significant because you are, at least from my point of view, the, the conduit or a connection between these scholars uh, and the more general public like myself, because you talk about this on Twitter. I just mentioned your Twitter handle again, Mr. Adnan Rashid. Uh, you also do uh, YouTube videos regularly. You talk about these things. You've done it recently on your YouTube channel. Um, so you, you, you're a really important way that uh, people like myself and others can learn about this uh, and to raise the awareness of the general public about how significant these inscriptions, these coins, these early textual evidences are for understanding of Islamic history. And, and as you say, how they're rolling back the, uh, the Orientalist uh, agenda with hard facts, uh, which can't really be denied. If you've got a coin that's dated you know, like that, I mean, it's exactly. hard. It's hard to deny it, really, isn't it? I mean, what, what do you say about that? So um, this is really, so your role in this, Adnan, is, uh, I think, absolutely crucial in, in uh, as I say, making known uh, from your academic world and your studies uh, th these findings for the general public. So I, I do commend you for that and obviously encourage you to continue with that, God willing. Inshallah. Inshallah. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to address uh, your followers, your audience, so that they can be aware of these things we have mentioned today. So, uh, so just finally, I would like to say that brothers and sisters out there, ladies and gentlemen, Muslims and non-Muslims, all of you, uh, don't always uh, uh, believe everything you come across online. Rather, look into uh, sources more objectively. I know it's not easy to sift through all academic sources and get, get the best uh, fruit out of it. It's, it's very difficult, but people like myself and Paul Williams are out there trying to simplify things for the general masses, and, and, and we're not perfect. We, we may also make mistakes, so please do forgive us for our shortcomings, and we will continue doing what we're doing. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, uh, be beautifully put, Adnan. Uh, uh, thank you uh, for that. Is that something I do on my, on my channel in my own small ways to host uh, scholars uh, such as yourself and uh, uh, other experts who, um, who we can listen to and learn, not because everything everyone says is 100% perfect, but we can uh, basically educate ourselves and make up our own minds. And particularly when we've got hard evidence, archaeological, textual, coinage, etc., it really makes it a very exciting subject, actually, because it's something tangible we can we can grasp and, and take away and tell others about. So thank you very much indeed, Adnan, for your valuable time, your expertise. God willing, uh, you will come back one day and uh, um, uh, amaze us and uh, with uh, further revelations, if that's the right word, um, inscriptions and the like uh, for us. So thank you very much indeed, Adnan. Till next time. Sure.